G'day everyone and welcome to another video in our Off Grid series. This one, we're going to be talking all about money. Money. We love talking about money. We're an open book when it comes to money. I feel like Paul Clitheroe from the <laughs> 90s doing a money episode. So just like Paul would say, uh, everything we're going to talk about here is just our personal experience. Uh, our biggest advice would be get some professional advice if you're making a big financial decisions. Uh, this is just our ideas, our philosophy on money, the way we approach it all. So take take it as uh, one, I guess, one example of, of how you can approach money when it comes to traveling around Australia and enjoying those off-grid campsites. But yeah, please do your own research. Yep. That's my little disclaimer. Done. <laughs> Done. <laughs> covered financially now. No one can sue us for bad financial advice. That's right. <laughs> now, if you're new to our channel and new to this off-grid series, we've been shooting an off-grid series throughout this year. Uh, this is part seven of that series, I'm pretty sure, if I haven't got my counting incorrect. Uh, we've been covering off water, power, uh, everything, logistics, logistics and everything like that, apps we use, all this sort of stuff. So if you, you haven't seen those videos, jump back and have a watch those after this one. As I said, this one's going to be all about Budgeting, finance, money when it comes to traveling, long term. How do we afford it? How much do we spend? All those sorts of things. Yep. Uh, not just for full timers like us or indefinite travelers like us, but how you might look at it if you're planning to do a shorter trip as well and some of the approaches you can take to money on that. Um, we will get to, at the end of the video, we will be sharing as well exactly how much money we've spent on a few things over the last couple of years to give you guys a bit of an idea. So speaking of money, every episode on our Off Grid series, we've got a $100 gift card from Everything Caravan and Camping to give away. Yep. And Eric Kuma, you are the winner of our last Off Grid series. So yep. congratulations. Uh, we'll leave you a comment on your comment. And um, if you could just send us an email, we'll... Uh, put you in touch with the guys from Everything Caravan Camping to get that voucher. Yeah, congratulations, Eric, and let us know what you spend your voucher on, mate. We yes. love getting that feedback, and thanks to everyone else that's won those vouchers for keeping in touch and letting us know what you've been spending them on. It's been awesome to see. Yeah, it's been so good. All right, and we are giving away, as Liz said, another $100 voucher in this episode. Uh, details of how you can win that at the end of the video. All right, let's dive in. I've got the laptop here next to me, so... We've if come if prepared. I, if I am, we've got a lot to get through, so we're going to dive in. But if I am looking away from camera, I do apologise. I'm not trying to be rude. Uh, I'm just making sure that we're staying on track and following our notes here on the laptop. All right, so asking travellers how much does it cost to travel Australia is the same as asking somebody how much does it cost to live in a home. Everyone is so different. It doesn't cost you the same amount as it costs your next door neighbour. And it's the same with traveling. So yep. how much money you're going to spend, the only person who can really tell you that is you. That's right. But with that said, we are going to use our costs and our spendings as an example to help you get your head around it a little bit. But I think the biggest thing to understand is that how, like we've said throughout this series, is how you travel, where you travel, how many people you've got in a traveling party, what your setup is. I mean, there's obviously going to be very different costs involved if you're just traveling the country in a four-wheel drive with a rooftop tent versus if you're traveling the country in an expedition truck. Obviously, the, the costs are going to be vastly different. Uh, so you do have to take that into consideration. So what we really want to do with this video, rather than just telling you all of what we've spent and then you take that away and think that that's um, going to give you some idea of what you're going to spend, we think what's much more relevant is showing you how we've gone about thinking about what we're going to spend and some of the costs that are involved so then you can go away and do your own sums and figure out exactly what your costs are going to be. Kind of like when we did the electrical video, uh, there's no point us telling you what our electrical setup is and then you assuming that that setup is going to be perfect for you. It's exactly the same thing. You've got to tailor it to your needs and your spending habits. And like Liz said, uh, what you're spending at the moment in your home is pretty much the best place to start to figure out what you're likely to spend when you get out on the road because your habits now, what you spend on certain things are probably not going to change that much. Yeah, and that's the key to it is that your spending habits are your spending habits and the more you know about how you spend and what you value, the more you're going to have a better grasp of how much it's going to cost you to travel. The best advice we could give you on how much it's going to cost you to travel Australia is to, after this video, get on your net bank, get on whatever banking app you've got, and just look at how much money has left your bank account in the last 12 months. Yeah. Every single dollar, everything for rent, for groceries, for fuel, for, you know, kids' clothes, haircuts, every single dollar that left your bank account 
and then try and categorize it into categories like rent, utilities, subscriptions, things like that. And then what you can do from there is just assess your spending habits. So how much you spend on groceries isn't going to change when you go traveling. Yeah. <laughs> it's just not going to change. Yeah, it's It might go up by 10 or 20% if you're traveling in rural remote areas because groceries cost more because of the transport cost. So, you know, you might want to budget that in a little bit, but your grocery spend is going to be the same. Yeah. Because that's your spending habits. You're going to cook the same things that you cook at home. You're going to eat out as much as you eat out at home. You're going to, you know, drink the same amount as what you drink at home. That's your habits. And then look at the categories and see what's going to stay the same and what's going to change when you go traveling. So if you're paying rent and you no longer need to pay rent because you're traveling, you can take that out. Well, I think that's the obvious one. But I think yeah. what surprises people is that... Um, People assume that when you go traveling that fuel, uh, accommodation and uh, groceries will be the lion's share of your spending. What we find is it's not. It's it's, it's just... lucky to be half of our total spend. And that and was a scary, scary day when we looked at, when we added it all up at the end of the year, wasn't it? Well, it wasn't just scary. I wouldn't say it was scary. It was more surprising for me that you yeah, where you think your true. money's going is not actually where your money's going. And I would, I would argue that for most people living in a house, it would be exactly the same thing if you went through and did the exercise that Liz was saying. We always tend to think of or remember the large um, amounts of money we're spending, the so the big ticket items, so things like your rent or your mortgage, um, all those types of things you're going to know about, it really adds up in all the little bits and pieces, and it's no different when you go traveling. So just the general everyday stuff, we don't really feel like we spend much money on things like clothes or new toys for the kids or things like that. Going out or experiences and... Yeah, you know, or eating out a lot, we don't eat out a lot. We're quite frugal, we're quite happy with you know. So we were quite surprised with how much of our spending in, in total for the year was actually just those little bits and pieces that you don't really take into consideration. If it's 20 bucks here, 50 bucks there, even 100 bucks there. I mean, even things like Christmas presents and birthday presents for the kids, all that sort of stuff adds up and it really will surprise you how much of your spending is in those little things. Now, obviously, once you've taken into account then, like Liz said, those costs that will change, there's there's going to be some costs that won't change that you're spending now, like your groceries and things like that. Some things you can take out, and then you want to then you can start to estimate, I guess, what um, you're going to spend on travel that you're not currently spending now. So obviously your fuel cost is going to go up, but you're still going to have registration isn't going to change. Your insurance probably isn't going to change significantly. Uh, roadside assistance you might crank that up, for example, but it's going to be a fixed cost that you're not going to have to worry about. Uh, changing too much. The big ones, I guess, that people want to know is how much do you spend on accommodation. That varies a, a significant amount, and it's a big advantage to having an off-grid setup is that you can lower that accommodation cost. And another big one is fuel. That's going to vary a lot from obviously setup to setup, like we said before. But it's not too hard to estimate. Um, have a look at the trip you're planning. How many k's is it? Roughly, what's your fuel usage? Roughly, what's the price per liter? It's not going to be terribly accurate, obviously, but it's going to give you a very good indication. Give you a ballpark. A ballpark of, ex of what you're likely to spend on fuel. Um, we'll go through, as I said at the end of the video, and, and, it, and outline how much we've spent on fuel. And over the two years, it's surprisingly averaged out at almost to the dollar. For most of our costs, haven't changed significantly. So not at all. It, obviously, cost of living has gone up a little bit in the last, well, significantly in some cases in the last little while, but we haven't really seen a huge um, variation to our, to our spend. All right, so we wanted to touch a bit on here about things that you can be thinking about and looking at before you set off on your trip. So again, whether this be uh, a couple of month trip, we're talking about sort of longer term trips here, not necessarily just your weekends and weeks away, but if you're doing sort of three plus months, six, 12 months or indefinite like us, there's some things you can be doing, I think, before you set off to help you get your head around financing and budget once you start to travel. Now, like we touched on earlier, your spending habits with groceries and things aren't likely to change too much unless you make a conscious effort to change them. And you can get into those habits now and start to look at what you're really spending your money on at the grocery store. And this is going to really depend uh, on your priorities, like what your, you know, a lot of people are on different um, diets these days, different have different health uh, priorities. Uh, for some people, money's their number one priority, whatever it might be. But in general, just take a look at what you're spending your money on. Uh, and we tend to try and, our biggest advice is try and, we try and shop for value. So if something that we normally buy or normally eat 
is for whatever reason goes up significantly in price or isn't good value that week, we just cut it out and substitute it with something else. And I think that's a really good habit to get into yeah. when you start in particular traveling to the more remote areas uh, because it is, it, although groceries generally get more expensive as you go more remote, it doesn't always um, affect everything across the board. Some things go up a lot more than others depending on their availability and I'm sure a whole lot of things like that. So. We really find being able to be very flexible with our diet and what we eat and, and what we buy has really helped us to keep the cost down. And I think you'll be surprised when we get to the end and tell you how much we spent on groceries in the last two years. People um, are flawed. <laughs> it's, it amazes a lot of people. And it really just comes down to being flexible. If some, Like if avocados are $3 each and, you know, we've got nachos planned, we'll just eat nachos without avocado in them. And we're happy to sacrifice the avocados because they're not good value for us at that time. Whereas other people will be like, oh, no, but they're $3 each. I have to buy them. I you, need my you don't, you don't have to buy them. It's yeah. your choice. Yeah. And, you know, just what what do you value most and go with that? Where are you going to get the best value for your dollar? And for some people, it depends on your priority. So, yeah, yeah we're not going to tell you how to, how to eat or anything like that. That's totally up, That's to, up you. to you. <laughs> but just understand where your money is and what your values are. So one of the big things that is going to impact how much you're going to spend on your trip is how fast you travel. So consider how long have you got? Have you got six months of long service? Have you got a year or are you traveling indefinitely or some other length of, time. length of time in between that? So if you're trying to do a 25,000 kilometer trip in six months versus if you're trying to do that same 25,000 Ks in 12 months, obviously the cost per week or the cost per month over that 12 month period is gonna be a lot lower than if you're trying to jam that into six months. But that being said, if six months is all you've got, six months is all you've got. Our general advice on that though is travel less, see more. So don't try and jam heaps in because you'll spend a lot of time in the car, seeing a lot of the highway and not necessarily seeing a lot of the country. Um, try and break it down into a smaller trip and just and slow down a bit and enjoy it a bit more is our general advice. Yeah, and we see lots of retired people who have time like nothing but time on their hands and they spend a month in a campsite they fish they learn this area really really well and their costs are just incredibly low if they find a good free camp or a good low cost camp they'll stay there for a month and just be happy as larry and i just think oh overheads so low like, yeah and we'll touch on yeah. more on that later in the video we're going to do a whole whole bit about that so really how much you're going to spend is ultimately going to come down to how long you're traveling for and how far are you going to be traveling if this is your once in a lifetime trip you're probably going to splurge more on all those experiences that you don't want to miss out on whereas for us who are traveling full-time indefinitely we wouldn't take our kids to you know a on a boat trip or a cruise every weekend if we were at home so we're not going to do it while we're traveling full-time either they're special occasion experiences for us that we limit to like how would you say that like we just well, we, we only splurge on them when it's something that we think is exceptional value for money yeah value for money and also just somewhere that we might not get back to something yeah. that we think is really going to suit the kids at their age that they are now yeah. there's been a few things like horizontal falls for example in the kimberley where the kids were too young we couldn't take both of them with us i think at the time james was too young so yeah. the logistics of trying to go on that trip without one of the kids and doing it separately or something like that if that was a once in a lifetime opportunity for you to be in the Kimberley and it was a it was a bucket list trip you yeah. might have gone to the effort to make that happen for us the way we looked at it was we're probably going to go back there in the next couple of years yes. when the kids are a bit older and it'll be much better value for money if we can all go together as a family and experience it together and and splash the money out then so there's always that for us that we a lot of these places we travel to or the areas we go to we feel confident that we're going to get back to those again that's different for some people that may not be the case for you so that, that, that's how we really assess how much we spend on activities. One of the big questions that we see quite a lot in the traveling community is how does everyone afford it? How are all these people out there doing what we do, traveling long term or full time or indefinitely, how do they afford it? Well, there's a couple of things at play here. Did you win Lotto? I didn't win Lotto, no. So, <laughs> well, unless you did not, I didn't know about it. <laughs> no. 
<laughs> so obviously, yeah, there's no, we're not all millionaires out there travelling. We're not all um, we haven't all struck it lucky. We're not all travelling on mum and dad's money or crypto. Big we hand. didn't we didn't win big on the nah, crypto shares I, either. I, I didn't sell a startup company or anything like that. Um, I'm sure there's some people out there who are and good on them and have fun, enjoy that. Uh, we kind of, I guess, had these spending habits early on, and for years we were quite frugal with our spending, um, and we're quite conscious about putting money away and saving and paying down debts as quickly as we could. All those types of habits that we set in pretty early on yeah. we didn't know that we were going to go and traveling australia full time that wasn't all the, the objective but we always knew we wanted to set ourselves up to be able to free ourselves of having to work in a nine to five job so we we set about putting money away setting ourselves up a little bit financially to be able to go and travel now the other thing that comes into play here is uh, do you sell the family home do you not sell your home do you have other assets you can sell to help fund your trip and things like that um, are you going to work on the road? Are you going to try and generate income? Or are you just, is it just more of a holiday? Um, obviously, a lot of people tap into long service leave and things like that. All those decisions are really going to vary significantly for the individual. And we would not want to sit here and try and give you advice on that. But we will give you a few things to think about in the way that we approach the decision. We decided to sell our home. Um, and it we had originally, if we were just going to do a six-month trip before we sold our home, uh, we had a camper trailer and a Hilux. It was a great setup. Took us everywhere. We camped for five, six years in that, doing weekends and weeks away. Yeah. Brilliant setup. Really simple, straightforward. Yeah, and if we were just doing, like Simon said, a six-month trip with our long service leave, we would have 100% left in our Hilux with our camper trailer and we would have camped in a camper trailer for six months with the kids. Absolutely. But when the opportunity came up, well, I guess when we made the decision, not the opportunity, when we, when we made the decision to extend the trip and it was a 12-month minimum trip, but we kind of always knew it was probably going to be longer than that. Uh, and the opportunity came up to sell our house when prices were reasonably good. I mean, we they obviously they got better since we sold it. But yeah, it, it, the opportunity came up to sell the house. We were never going to live in that house again. Uh, we'd actually already moved out of it and it was rented out and we were renting a house but we were never going to live in that house again we knew we didn't want to move back to that area where the house was so for us it was really uh there was not much emotion involved in that decision it was very much a financial decision we decided to sell our family home um or sell it what was an investment at that time buy a caravan so upgrade our setup buy a new car and upgrade that spend some of the money on that and the rest of the money we invested uh, into the share market and that's where we keep our money so that that money continues to build and grow and that when we've had enough of traveling or we do decide to stop traveling that um, we've got some money there to to get back into the into the property, property market, market if we want to. if we decide to yeah but I think the big thing here that we talk a lot about is people's risk tolerance to that now some people yes. um, you know for us, we were quite comfortable with that decision. There's a lot of people out there that aren't comfortable with that decision, and that's that's absolutely fine. Uh, you may be able to look at other things like renting that house out and whether that income from the rent will offset its costs, obviously, but also give you some income. Um, but, yeah, there's, there's big decisions to be made there as to how to afford it. But I think the... Maybe let that truck go. We'll let that truck go. I think the main message here with how do you afford it is everyone does it differently. Um, and it, again, it depends how long are you planning to travel for uh, and how are you planning to travel. I want to really get out there that you do not need to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on the best setup. There are backpackers out there traveling in $10,000 cars with a rooftop tent on top and having the, the time, time of, their, of lives. their lives. The absolute time of their lives. Sometimes we look at them and be like, oh, do you reckon we can go party with them? <laughs> now, obviously, that may not be practical if you've got kids and you're a family like us or depending on your circumstances, that may not suit you. But I guess the point is that what, how much you invest in your setup is going to depend on your own fin finances, your own situation, but also... Again, how long are you going to travel for? Uh, if you're only going to do a six-month trip uh, or even a 12-month trip for a lot of people, to go out and spend you know, $100,000 plus on a caravan and have an upgrade cars and vehicles and fit it all out with all these different things, you can get very carried away, spend a whole lot of money, and it's a lot of money you're probably not going to get back uh, or you're only going to get cents on the dollar in back when you return. And I, I guess it might seem a bit hypocritical for us to say that in quite an expensive caravan and and i mean our range is still it. there but we do have a land cruiser coming and spending a lot of, lot of money on that but there's different priorities for us we travel full time we're doing it indefinitely this is our home and this is also our business um so there's different things that come into play there with that we've obviously got the opportunity to showcase uh different ways to travel and things like that um, but it's our mobile office, it's everything, and we're able to generate, we're fortunate enough to have, to have 
been able to generate income while we travel, which allows us to do it differently. And Absolutely. we're going to touch more on the income thing so, later in the video. Yes. Let's just stress that you do not need the best of the best of everything before you go. There are just so go many families. Just what you've got. Yep. And if you need to buy something or upgrade something, there are shops around Australia you can do that once you work out what you actually need. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, don't feel like you've got to have everything and ev anything before you set off and yeah. assuming that you're going to need it all. Um, you're going to end up very expensive and probably overweight as well. Yeah, and we definitely see families travelling with tents. We see families travelling with, ca with camper trailers. We see families traveling in buses and vans and you know all sorts of different setups and it's just it's beautiful to see just the diversity in the range and that everyone gets to enjoy the same beach no matter what your setup is or the same mountains you yeah know. everyone does it their way and what they can do and it's just yeah just get just, out there and enjoy just it prioritize if you want to go look at what your budget is and just work with that yeah, don't try. Don't wait until you can afford this really big flash setup before you go. Just go, go with what you can, and and you'll yeah, you won't look back. You won't regret it, and hopefully you get to do it again or extend your trip. Okay, so the when it comes to the actual costs of travel, we want to we we kind of categorize these costs into into two categories. Categorize into two categories that works. Yeah. You've got your fixed costs and the variable costs. Now, fixed costs are going to be the things like your rego, your insurance, roadside assistance. Um, what else can you think of? Fixed gonna, costs. Yeah, fixed costs. Uh, your subscriptions, things like that. Um, your other asset costs, if you do decide to keep a you know, real estate, um, you're going to have some costs associated like with your that. your rates and whatnot. Yeah, and obviously you've got then the costs that people probably don't uh, allow as much for, which is your lack of income or reduced income and obviously the depreciation on any assets you buy like your caravan and your car and things like that is also probably something worth considering if you're looking at the total cost of a, of a big trip. Um, they're likely to be significant costs to that. Then obviously you've got your variable costs which are things we've touched on before like food and fuel and accommodation costs. Um, your general household spending like clothes and knickknacks, souvenirs, haircuts, haircuts um, all that sort of stuff, which like we said, will add up surprisingly. This is why we all have long hair. Um, if you've got, <laughs> yeah, if you've got hobbies like um, you know, fishing, obviously there's going to be some money spent on that, um, mountain biking, snow, snow yeah. trips, all that sort of stuff is going to add up as well. And eating out um, and, and you know, getting out and having a good time, which is something we do enjoy doing from time to time. Um, but yeah, we don't, we don't. And it, again, that depends. How much we eat out really depends. And, where we are um yeah. obviously if we're in the middle of the outback we don't go out for coffee and we don't go out to the brewery because there isn't one uh if we're you know somewhere like margaret river region bustleton we love that area and yeah. there's heaps of breweries and wineries to explore and it can get very carried away there going <laughs> going out and uh, enjoying those you're kidding yeah <laughs> i don't know anyone who would get carried away at a brewery yeah now, so obviously fixed costs being fixed, they're the ones you're not going to be able to change. And they're the ones that are really easy to budget around. But don't don't feel like they you can't get a better deal on your insurance and things like that. They're worth looking at. I mean, Reggie, you probably can't do a whole lot about. Although if you are traveling full time, maybe look at if there's another state you can register your vehicle and your caravan in that might work out cheaper. Um, but yeah, in general, those fixed costs are going to be fixed. So that's going to give you your sort of baseline of what the trip's going to cost. Break it down per month or per week or whatever it is you prefer to do. And then your variable costs that are, they're the ones you're going to have more control over and they're going to be more influenced by things like how and where you travel, how quickly you travel, all that kind of thing. Okay, so obviously this being our off-grid series, what are the pros and cons when it comes to budgeting and finance of having a good off-grid setup? The biggest one I would say is the upfront cost versus the ongoing cost. And what I mean by that is well, setting up for off-grid isn't cheap, uh, particularly when it comes to electrical systems and things like that. There is going to be a significantly higher uh, upfront cost, depending on how far you go with that and how long you want to be able to spend off-grid. And if you want to do all those calculations, go back and watch our electrical video and our water video yep. and ones like that to figure that out. I almost had like a little mini heart attack. I remember being in the rental in Canberra and you told me how much we were going to spend on an electrical system. And I was like, what? <laughs> And I said, yeah, what, if you think we need it, yeah, go for it. And I have never, ever regretted spending that money. Never, ever. Yeah. Because what it allows us to do is, is not just spend time off grid and save money on accommodation, but it allows us to travel the way we want to travel and travel to the places that we wanted to be able to travel where there just isn't an alternative. 
So when it comes to an off-grid setup and finances, you've obviously got that increased upfront cost, but the, the flip side to that is that your ongoing costs are likely to be lower because you can not only, not just because you can free camp, but even when we do stay in caravan parks, we generally don't, don't get it. Don't powered sites. Don't need a powered site. The other advantage of that is is booking. Is 100%. So we find that there's a lot of chatter in the different groups and communities on Facebook and online about, you know, where do I need to book and how far out do I need to book and should I book? And we find that the places that tend to fill up are the powered sites in desirable remote locations. So places like Broome, Kununurra. Um, Even around Darwin. Darwin, places like that. People, they get worried that they're not going to be able to get a campsite because they need power. And to, often water as well. And water. And so those places are, are the first places that fill out. Whereas for us, if we're set up for off-grid travel, we don't need a PowerPoint, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and we can carry a boatload of water. So we have a lot more options available to us and it's easier to get water than it is to get power. Yeah, so it not only saves us money in that respect, but it also allows us to keep our travel plans a lot more flexible because um, we're more than happy to pull up on the side of the road if we need to. If a town is booked out and we can't even get an unpowered site, it doesn't actually matter because we've got the resources, we can go and camp out of town somewhere and we don't need access to that. So it saves us money there, but it would take, I think anyone would um, struggle to argue that it will pay for it itself in any sort of short period of time I would no. you wouldn't do it purely fun for financial reasons obviously like I said earlier there's other a lot of other benefits to having an off-grid setup uh, but saving money is a nice little I guess silver lining in a way in the, having travel freedom travel freedom is, is, the, is the big one but yeah. yeah it will it will take a long time to pay itself off that system but that being said it, do, it will save you some money and I just think too, it makes your setup more desirable for resale as well. It does help because a lot of people want to travel that way at the moment. Yeah. yeah. So it probably will help you. Um, yeah. That investment you will recoup when you go to sell to a point. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So that's a lot about costs and what it costs. Obviously on the flip side of that is income, generating income. income. Are you going to be trying to generate income while you travel? Now that's a decision in itself. And again, that's going to probably come down to how long you've got to travel. Yeah. Um, if you're only, again, if you've got a six month trip planned or if you're going to do a 12 month trip for a lot of people, uh, stopping and working along the way or doing other sort of work as you travel, any time you spend doing that is obviously going to take time away from your travel. So for some people, it may not be worth it, particularly on those shorter uh, periods of time. If you're taking away a lot of time to work as you go, you're probably going to miss out on a lot of the travel and you may get home and afterwards and realize you didn't make the most of it. But that being said, if you need to, to make it work, then go for it. Make go it work. For it. I just want to touch on one little thing first is that a lot of people see YouTube accounts, Instagram accounts, and Facebook accounts, TikTok accounts, and that being the way you generate money on the road. That's just one tiny portion of the actual traveling community because there are thousands, like genuinely thousands of families and couples making and making money and working on the road. They just don't share it. And you, because they're not sharing it, you don't see that side of it unless you actually are on the road traveling and meeting these people. So yeah, I would know, say content creation and social media, uh, people that are making money from that, uh, less less than 1% of travellers, but there's a disproportionate amount of that that you will see and be exposed to sitting at home because obviously they're the people that you see. Yeah, you watch people like us on YouTube, uh, follow those type of accounts on Instagram. So it can seem like that is the main way to generate income on the road and it's by far the, the vast majority are doing it. By far the vast majority are doing a whole range of other things uh, to generate income on the road. So we thought we wanted we want to touch on that. Yeah. Uh, we don't want to discourage anyone. If you do want to go down in the same path as us and do social media and everything like that to generate income, go that's great. Yeah. I would say though, if you're going to do anything less than 12 months or 12 months or anything less, it's you're, you're not going to make money in your first year by unless you. I, I, I mean, it's extremely unlikely, I will say, that you would make money in your first yeah. year. Our first year of YouTube, we spent over $10,000 on the channel. So that's like, getting set up with cameras and, and laptops and subscriptions we needed and yeah, everything software. we needed, all the software and everything to do our editing. We, we invested $10,000 knowing that we were going to do it long term. Yeah. Um, and if you look at our 10% uh, monthly donations to charity, we 
generate around about a thousand dollars a month from our YouTube channel. So yeah, and that's only in the last twelve months. So the first twelve months, it, it generated enough, and it didn't generate anything. So it's by no means a get rich get. It's by no means a get rich quick scheme. Well, no, it's a, it's very long term. So it's I, long -term. I think the short thing on that is if you're going to travel long term or indefinitely like us, and that's what you want to do, and you want to build it as a business like we have. Go for it. it. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, we wouldn't want to discourage anyone from doing that, but uh, we do just want to make sure that it's uh, there's a bit of a reality check out there, I guess, that yeah. it's not a quick way to make money. Um, and yeah, you can't certainly, you're not going to offset a 12 month trip by doing some social media and making money on the side. Yeah. Um, I think the amount of time that you would invest in that and therefore the amount of time that you would take away from your travels, you would come back after 12 months and think that was probably not the best way to go about it. So yeah, yeah we wanted to touch on that. So what are the other ways that we see people making money or around the... Around, around, the, around the country. Around the country. So a lot of people are working remotely. So with advancements in uh, technology and access to internet, there are a lot of people who are um, just doing what they were always doing, but remotely from the office. And if you can work from home, if you have internet access, you can work from anywhere. Home can be, you know, Winter Bandy Beach. Home can be Broom. Home can be Darwin. So there's a lot of people who have maybe just scaled back their hours. They've gone from, a, you know, a 0.1 a 1.0 load down to like a 0.6 load and they work three days a week and they still have all their regular jobs so we're talking psychologists doctors um nurses teachers yeah you, we've business insurance, owners insurance, insurance brokers, brokers heaps yeah and heaps. He, just any job that you can do remotely a lot of admin and book work keeping, bookkeeping type work, a lot of that sort of stuff people are able to do remotely. So I think what we've seen, because we're definitely seeing an increase in this over the last 12, 18 months, and yep. I think it's off, off the back of COVID. Uh, it's probably one of the silver linings to COVID is that it normalized um, working from home or working remotely. Obviously, a lot of employers had to get used to that concept very quickly. Uh, and now a bit of that is, is hanging around. A lot of employers are quite happy for their employees to work remotely. And that can obviously, like Liz said, not just be your, your fixed address home, but a mobile home as well. Um, and obviously, coinciding with that is the advancements in um, remote access to internet and communication. So if you have watched our last off-grid video we did on internet go and watch that one we talk all about Starlink and 4 and 5G setups and, and a whole range of different things that we've tried uh, but I think those advancements particularly Starlink um, in in recent times has coincided with that and we're now seeing a whole lot of particularly younger people um, young families and young couples that are able to generate um, an income doing exactly what they were doing or very similar to what they were doing before but now just doing it on the road um, I guess the other main way is is to work in the places that you travel. Look at what your skill sets are. If you're willing to have a crack, there is so much work available, particularly in the more remote towns and the yeah. touristy towns. Um, if you're if you're you know happy to go and do entry level jobs, you know, and and or if you can adapt your existing skill set to get those um, those other jobs that are out there as well. Um, that's a really common way. That's and particularly as well um, with the fewer backpackers and fewer overseas travelers now there's a real glut for for farm anything from farm work through to hospitality jobs um retail you know, retail all of those type of jobs that most of us could just walk into um and have a crack at but again coming back to what we we're saying before um it depends how long your trip is because you may not want to stop somewhere and work for a month if your trip's six months long that might be too much to take out of it so you got to find that balance but I think the main message here is we want to get out is that this is not the only way to make money on the road and it's certainly not the majority of people out there traveling making money on the road are doing what we do um, and that there is a lot of opportunity out there to make to generate an income um, while you travel. We're also seeing a lot of people who are working short-term blocks so you know teachers who are taking a term at, of work and then traveling for the rest of it nurses or doctors doing a locum Tradies. Um, tradies. Like, yeah. Absolutely. Doing. So much work out there for tradies. Um, yeah. And yeah. and you can pretty much walk into a job as either a skilled labourer or, or in the trade. Um, yeah. I've been offered a few jobs as we've been going around or a few opportunities. And yeah, particularly in the more remote places and, and like, yeah, WA and places where they've had some impact by cyclones and things. It's just, yeah, there's heaps of work out there is the short answer. Absolutely. Yeah. And lots of seasonal work too in high tourist seasons or in like um, fruit picking seasons like vintage in wineries like we love working at our mates winery doing yeah. vintage it, it just there's so much opportunity out there you just got to think about what your skill sets are 
what your risk tolerance is and how long you want to travel for. And what you want to be doing. Yeah. That's the big one. So there are obviously active ways that you can go about making money um, on the road or generating income on the road. And obviously the other big one is going to be those passive income sources. Things like if you do have real estate that you sit on that um, has positive cash flow that's going to generate some income. Um, if you've got shares like us, they might be able to generate you some income as you go um, or other businesses and things that you might be involved in. Um, any of those passive income uh, opportunities are out there as well uh, if you've got that money invested. So. By combining those two things, which is pretty much what we do, combining a bit of our investments with a bit of our work that we do on the road, um, they're the two ways we make money. Centrelink is another way that some people, are obviously pensioners, but some people are eligible for Centrelink payments as well as they travel. A lot of those Centrelink payments that people are eligible for don't require them to be at a fixed address and live in the same place, so they're able to travel and still have access to those Centrelink benefits. So depending on your circumstances, it could be worthwhile looking into um, whether you're gonna be eligible for those. And as your situation changes, um, from going working full time to potentially working less or not at all, you may find there's other Centrelink benefits that you may be uh, eligible for that you weren't before. So it's probably something that, it's got a bit of stigma around it, um, but I figure if you're eligible for it, go for it. That's how I look at it. But um, yeah, it's it's something that uh, probably a lot of people miss is um, is what settling benefits that might be out there for them, particularly if you're a young family or, or a parent. All right, so we're just gonna just briefly touch on uh, how much money we've spent over the last two years. And like we said, we don't track all of our costs. Um, so this is, we're just gonna really touch on some of those main ones that we get a lot of questions about, which is obviously accommodation, fuel, and uh, what's the other one? Groceries. Groceries, groceries. Yes. Um, so f some things that aren't included in our grocery budget are um, grog, we don't include my beer budget and our wine budget in that. So that's on top of this. That's something to keep it's in pretty mind. Pretty much just triple our budget. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, and we don't, we haven't added up how much we spend eating out, um, you know, beers at breweries and wineries, although we don't do many wineries, um, coffee shops, grabbing a pie from the bakery occasionally, um, although it's been a bit more frequent lately. Things like that aren't included in our groceries. It's literally just what we buy at the supermarket. Um, so, so when we sat down to do this, actually, just before we filmed this um, and turned the camera on, we were actually really surprised when we compared, we haven't actually done it before, compared our first year and second year of travel and how what's um, stayed pretty much the same, same and scarily close and what's changed a little bit. Uh, but in general, I guess we've, we've found our average because the average is very, very close. So let's kick into it. So in our first year of travel, we basically went from Canberra to Melbourne to Adelaide to Darwin to Broome to Perth and back across to um, our hometown of Leeton, which let's call it Canberra, it's close enough. Wagga, Wagga region. Wagga region. So that took us, we did that in that first year, we did 32,836 kilometres um, in that first 12 months. Yeah. And in our second year, we went from, say, Canberra up to Brisbane, up to uh, Cooktown. Almost, almost to Cooktown. Almost to Cooktown, then back down through the uh, through snow, the snow, uh, Vic High Country, down the south coast of New South Wales, down at the Victorian coast, into Tassie. Yep. And then back ba up again. Back to the mainland. Back to back to Leeton, which we are now. And the second year yeah. was so that was twenty six thousand six hundred and sixty three kilometers so between the two years we did in our second year we did about six thousand kilometers less than in our first year um which was quite deliberate actually we realized in our first year we probably went a bit too quickly and yeah traveled a bit too quickly and we made a deliberate decision to slow down a little bit um a few things got in the way of that and we actually ended up doing a bit more than what we planned but yeah we ended up doing just over that twenty six thousand. but interestingly fuel cost uh was identical or almost exactly the same. 100 litres, kilometres, wait. Spit it out. Yeah, <laughs> you say it. So in the first year we spent a touch over $9,000 on fuel, $9,041, which was $173.87 a week. And in the second year we spent $8,865 on fuel uh, or $170 a week. So near enough to $170, $175 a week on fuel. Now, obviously, we did a lot 
fewer k's the second year but in case no one noticed the fuel the price, price went, went up. up so the average ended up saying about the same um, so in uh, just to give you an idea as well on average we use about 17 and a half liters per 100 k's with the ranger um, that's a mixture of towing and not towing so that's just over the entire year we average about 17 and a half liters per 100 uh, so that's what that that is worked out on all right so what did we spend on accommodation in our first year so traveling through the south australia northern territory wa we spent four thousand nine hundred and fifty seven dollars on campsite fees which is pretty bloody good considering we were paying 500 bucks a week renting canberra yeah so, so that works out about 95 just a touch over 95 dollars a week and that's with a lot of free camping and a lot of low-cost camps yep and then in our second year when we traveled the east coast we actually spent less. So we stayed with a lot of family and a lot of friends. You know, we've met a few people. <laughs> yeah, and we spent $2,169 on accommodation in our second year of travel. Yeah, which, which worked out to be a tiny $41, just almost $42 a week on accommodation in our second year of travel. Yeah. That's pretty incredible. So I think that there highlights one of those benefits we were talking about of having a really good off-grid system and be able to spend a lot of time off-grid. I think in that first year where we spent almost $5,000 on accommodation, about 10 nights of that we're actually plugged into power and paying for a powered site. So yeah. you can see there that it, it allows us, like we said, not just to stay off-grid and in free camps and low-cost camps, but also just to spend less on caravan parks because we don't need to be plugged into power. And then groceries, uh, we spent 10300 in our first year and 10334 Literally $34 difference in our total yeah. grocery spend first year to second year. Yeah. So we average that's that habits. one out perfectly. That is just 100% habit. And I think that's what we were touching and, and that highlights what we were touching on earlier in the video where what you spend now is likely to be very similar to what you spend on the road uh, because you eat what you eat and it's all very similar. Um, and in the same way for us, uh, what we spend in year one to year two is exactly the same, basically. So that works out to be about just under $200 a week, basically, is our grocery spend, which surprises a lot of people. And I know if that's feeding a family of four. Yeah. Um, and this is where we were saying your spending habits of the grocery store can have a big impact on your total spend. Uh, and don't underestimate how much those small items and those things that just cost a little bit more um, will add up and will, will have a big impact on your grocery spend. We like to think, or we do shop for value. Um, like we yeah. said, we'll adjust what we eat based on prices. Um, we don't eat a lot of red meat if it's expensive. Where seafood's cheap, we'll eat seafood. Where seafood's expensive, we won't eat seafood. Yeah. Um, Buy so what's in season, what's on sale. Fruit, fruit and veg. We try and we try yeah. and shop um, if we can away from the grocery stores a little bit as well for fruit and veg. Although it is pretty tricky, and we're hopeless at missing markets even when we're in the town the day they're on it's a become a habit I don't know. Oh, we don't buy a lot of convenience foods because we've got more time on our hands to make food from scratch and it's just a lot cheaper so yeah that works as well the yeah. thermomix is great for that yeah uh so that means um for the hot the two years uh our total average across the two years for accommodation groceries and for fuel comes in to be 440 dollars a week um Pretty, pretty cost effective, pretty cheap. As Liz said, that's less than we spent on rent alone when we were living in Canberra. So that works out to be a little under $23,000 for a year at that $440 a week average. Now I can tell you we spend significantly more than $23,000 traveling each year. And this is what we sort of mentioned earlier in the video is that fuel accommodation and groceries, while they will be significant parts of your budget and your total spend, it is not gonna be, um, I think ours is less, we spend over at least $50,000 a year. Yeah. To six fifty to sixty, um, as I said, that first year was a bit more expensive, and it depends. It depends on a lot of things and what we're upgrades we're doing, what we're buying, and things like that. But a good ballpark is about fifty to sixty grand a year um, total spend, and when you think groceries, fuel, and accommodation only makes up twenty three thousand yeah. of that, um, or just a little under twenty three thousand of that, you can see how it's less than 50% of our total spend, which floored us. We couldn't believe that when we first added it up, but then I when you start to- every item that we'd spent. I was like, we've missed something that costs like $40,000, what have we missed? We literally redid the figures multiple times because yep. we just it just did not make sense to us until we went through and said, okay, where is the rest of our money going? And it is in all these things that you forget about. Um, a couple of things were, you know, 
you go on a, cru a boat cruise or something like that, there was a couple of those. I'm talking $1,000 for the year, but you only need 20 things that cost $1,000 for the year and you spend another 20 grand. It's simple maths, right? I mean, buying new linen for the van, buying a new push bike for a birthday. Getting snorkeling gear when you're in, you know. Our coffee machine broke down, we had to buy a new coffee machine. These are all costs that we uh, incorporate into our daily spend when we live in a house and we don't even think about. Yeah. It's exactly the same when we're living on the road. These things, things break, we have to replace them. We haven't had any significant or major or even minor really um, mechanical. mechanical issues or anything like that, but even just the general servicing of the car general servicing of the caravan wheel alignments, wheel alignments tires like all these new sunnies because the kids have broken them again. that's <laughs> where most of your money is going to go so yeah. i really wanted to make sure we pointed that out because i think a lot of people get quite uh focused or fixated on fuel accommodation and grocery costs uh it will probably be 30 to 40 percent if you travel like us 30 to 40 percent of your total spend probably closer to 40 percent of your total spend if you travel like us, if you live like us. Um, I'd be interested if anyone else has done the sums out there um, to know what you spent and how much those three big three, the, f the groceries, accommodation and uh, and fuel, what percentage of those were of your total budget. But um, yeah, I mean, there's all those fixed costs as well. I mean, insurance and registration. Insurance on our caravan is almost $3,000 a year. Um, obviously car insurance on top of that as well. Uh, and registration so there's five grand just there just in 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 um in registration and insurance costs more than five grand really as paul clitheroe would say it's not about earning more it's about spending less and and that just is our number one mantra when it comes to personal finances um whether we're traveling or not but it really comes into play when we're traveling. We do want to just drop a couple of quick tips that we found really helpful for saving money on the road. So this is a big one. Yeah, all right, so number one is get yourself the Wikicamp app and f use that to find free camps and low cost camps because that is gonna save you a heap of money. That $6 that that app costs is going to save you hundreds if not thousands of dollars in campsite fees yep if you haven't watched our planning and logistics video we did for off grid series we go into far more detail on that and we do have a video coming up on our channel of how to get the most out of wiki camp so make sure you subscribe keep your eye out for that one as well tip number two, two. is again and we mentioned that video is the fuel map app um, finding cheaper fuel makes a massive difference fluctuations can be more than 10 cents a litre in the same town from one servo to another we found one that was 30 cents difference between one side of town and the other side of town yep Just and maximize your fuel discounts do your research look at fuel discounts we find at the moment coles express is by far uh, the easiest one because you can add up discounts you can spend money in store and do some of your groceries there plus your grocery store discount plus other discounts you can add them all together you get up to 18 cents a litre which saves a stack of money if you are buying anything, like I mean anything, like even if you're buying a hairbrush online, look for a discount code. Yep. Put it in your, like add it into your shopping trolley or your cart, go online, search for a discount code, and if you can't find one, then exit it. And then I guarantee within the next 48 hours on your social media account, you will get a promo offer of some sort and get a 10 or 20% or a free shipping offer just use yep. discount codes to your advantage for anything you buy and search secondhand because a lot of items, it's better for the environment if you're buying it secondhand and it's usually in really good condition and it saves you money. So yep. go on Marketplace, go on Gumtree, go on, um, what's the other big one, eBay. Be savvy with your money. Find things that are secondhand. It's just a win, win, win. We love it. We love We're, yep. we're massive bargain hunters. Like we are... We love it. Love it. Love it. How can you win the $100 voucher we're giving away for everything caravan and camping? Same as every week, if you've been following this whole series, you'll know exactly what you need to do, and chances are you've already done two out of the three things you need to do. That is, subscribe to this YouTube channel. Uh, we'd really appreciate that, and it does help us out, and it means you've done the first thing to enter that giveaway. Number two is to jump over and sign up to the Everything Caravan and Camping newsletter. There is a link for that in the description below. And the third one, leave us a comment. Let us know what you thought of this video. Let us know that you've done those three things, or two of those. Obviously, the comment is the third thing. Let us know that you'd like to be in the draw to win that $100 voucher, and we look forward to drawing that in our next part of the Off Grid series. Heaps more content coming up on the channel, especially 
around our brand new caravan. We've got walkthrough videos, we've got install videos of some cool gear that we're fitting up to the van as well. Uh, and then we're kicking back into our travels. As many of you know, we've got some big travel plans this year. We're getting up to southeast Queensland and northeast New South Wales, kicking off our east-west crossing in the coming weeks as well. All that and heaps more coming up on the channel. Can't wait to show you all that, guys. Make sure you subscribe. Thanks for watching, and we will see you next Sunday. See you next Sunday, and hopefully we see you on the road soon because you've nailed your budget down and you're ready to go. <laughs> Look out for us in the titanium because yeah. we're a bit incognito at the moment. <laughs> all right, guys. See, ya. see you later.